How you doing? My name is Adam Neal and I'm going to be shooting this show called Wheels of the Neals. Uh, before we get into our projects, I wanted to just give you all a little narrative introduction to what this show is about and why I'm doing it. Um, I do not have any actual training as a mechanic. Uh, it has been a hobby of mine uh, for a number of years. I've got quite a little collection of classic cars that I've been working on restoring various systems, everything from TLC to somewhat major repairs. Uh, it's, it's been a hobby though for the last years, uh, last about six years or so since I got into it. My gateway drug, you might say, was a 1986 Porsche 944, uh, which we still have around, although I've sold it to my good friend Sean. We'll be seeing it in some of the episodes as well. Um, but I, So it's been a hobby, it's been something, a, a passion that I really love to do, but uh, not really a source of income in any uh, in any way, you know. I've the only cars I've sold are to my friend, and uh, it all has been just at you know cost of what I put into it or less. And um, as my actual training is as an academic, I have lots and lots of degrees, uh, bachelor's, two masters, and I'm in the very last stages of a dissertation for my PhD. All of that in theology and philosophy and um, and apologetics in my PhD. So I've got a lot of academic training, but nothing in mechanics as such. And so uh, the internet has allowed me to own these great cars, these classic German cars, and dispel a lot of the mystery through the use of forums, and particularly through those brave souls who uh, produce YouTube shows or, you know, at least uh, segments about fixing this, replacing that. Uh, what are you looking at? And so between these resources, I have basically self-taught uh, and have basically learned by doing. And so I've come a long way. I've learned a great deal. I've learned a number of systems. Uh, again, all of this has been a hobby until very recently. This year, I was laid off at my job of nine years. It was a very bitter ending, very unfortunate, and still kind of recovering from that personally and emotionally. Um, but, uh, and because of the timing, being laid off in late May as an academic, there are very little job opportunities, and so, um, I, if I get another academic job, if I get another teaching job, it very likely won't be until next fall. So I have a year to try to figure out what am I going to do with myself. I live in a very rural area, so there's not a lot for academics to do here other than teach at the one college where I got laid off. So, uh, in trying to explore my options... I thought, hey, maybe I can start contributing back to the internet by creating videos, answering questions, and introducing tools, and all of that sort of stuff. I have a lot of years of experience as a teacher, so I'm very articulate, and I can understand systems, break it down, and try to explain it. And so uh, I'm going to create these shows and... Uh, particularly emphasize the the do-it-yourself restoration. At present, I am I am just working out of my yard. Quite literally, we have a garage, but it's very tight, so it's actually easier to work outside. Um, so part of the show is also going to be seeing if I can actually launch a restoration business. So as I'm doing these tasks um, that the show will center around, I'll also include narrative segments and. Um, some of the, particularly if we can get a business going so that we can get a seller's license uh, and I can start buying and selling again, uh, part of the show will be actually tracking down these classic cars. I tend to try to buy them right as they are at the, at the bottom, just before they're going to something major is going to fail or, you know, they're just, you know, one breakdown away from going to the junkyard. A lot of times, particularly the reason why I love the German cars is mechanically they tend to be just solid uh, and it's usually weird stuff. It's usually sensors. It's usually these odd systems. Uh, somebody put in a part that wasn't right and that sort of stuff. So uh, a, an element of the show is also going to be exploring these cars and their systems as I buy them, maintain them, restore them, service them, and so forth. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about me and, and what the show is about. Um, you know, my, my personal priorities are I'm a very deeply devoted Christian, and each of the segments, each of the show, uh, we're going to end with a prayer, and 
Uh, I'm very deeply devoted to my family. Uh, I have a, a wonderful, beautiful, brilliant wife, uh, Lauren, and two wonderful kids, uh, Sinclair and Ruth, who are four and two, respectively. Uh, right now, because I'm not working, I, I, I'm still living on severance, and if I don't find something, uh, unemployment in the near future, I'm staying at home with our two-year-old. Our four-year-old goes with my wife to uh, school. He's in pre-K, and she's finishing up her teaching certification. She wants to teach elementary school. Uh, although she's also very highly educated, it's kind of a grinding point for me because she's got a bachelor's and two masters, and yet she's have to gone, had to gone back for multiple years of uh, further schooling to get her teaching certification in order to be able to teach elementary school, which I find absurd. Uh, but she's very close to the end, and she's going to be working on that throughout the year. So uh, part of this is going to be the drama of our life, just in the background of what's happening. What are we doing? How are we surviving? Is this something that I can turn from a hobby into a business? Uh, you know, it, in a sense, it's kind of the American dream. I'm I'm going out going out on my own and trying to figure out my way forward in the world. And can we make it? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. My greatest uncertainty and anxiety right now is what do I do about medical insurance because the government is all up in the air about it and it's just a mess and the loss of medical benefits is in some regards even scarier to me than my loss of a salary. But all of that is uncharted waters uh, and it is, it is ahead. Uh, so I am going to try to brave my way forward and um, produce this show. Maybe it'll become a source of income, I don't know. But at the very least, I can contribute some segments back to the internet and uh, help solve people's issues and answer some questions and show some detailed uh, breakdowns of systems and that sort of thing. So I'm greatly looking forward to it, and I hope you all will follow me on this wonderful journey. All right, for today's projects, we're going to be working on our 1989 Ford F-150 codenamed Balrog. We're going to be putting a smog pump into that. We're also going to be replacing the throttle position sensor, or TPS, in our 88 BMW 528E, uh, codenamed Bateman. And the title of our pilot episode is Learning to Fail and Failing to Learn. The reasoning behind this is that, you know, partially this show is uh, happening. It's, you know, inception as a result of a great failure in my life, the sequence of events which led to me getting laid off at my, uh, my job of nine years and, you know, lead me to try to pursue new options. So there's a, there's a background dimension there. But specific to the, the, the working on and restoring cars and vehicles more generally, there's a reality that we have to come to grips with. If you want to do do-it-yourself restorations, you are going to fail. It is, a, it is a reality that there will be jobs both that you do not you know, complete right or you do complete it right and it just doesn't fix the scenario. In fact, that is the situation with both of our projects today. The F-150, I was replacing the smog pump. The symptoms were sluggish acceleration, uh, bad fuel economy, you know, bad, 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 like way, you know, I'm not looking for good fuel economy out of a 351 Windsor, but it was just chugging and and just seemed like it was just losing power. It should have been a lot stronger. So we were trying the smog pump, uh, <clears throat> and I successfully replaced the smog pump, as you will see in the segments, but that did not actually fix the scenario, and in fact, uh, after the fail, then it got even worse and led me to re put the original smog pump back in, which I did off camera, uh, put it back and it didn't change anything and we had a no run situation for a while, uh, which you'll have to see in a later episode what happens with that. Uh, so that was a fail. The 528E, the BMW, uh, I got it. It had a number of electrical issues, you know, still working on tracking those down previous owner doing weird hacks and this and that's on it. Um, but when I got it home and I started to, uh, after trading and got it home and started to go through the wires, one of the negative cables that was hanging loose hit the positive and fried something. And so I looked into the wiring diagrams and figured out that the only wire that grounds in that location, you know, every, all, all signs pointed to the TPS, the throttle position sensor, which also accounts for the, uh, after that, that touching of the wire, 
it would stall out really bad, uh, inconsistent idle, and it would stall out, uh, you know, just, just terrible, terrible. So, um, you know, you couldn't drive it anywhere like that. So it was a no run situation. And, uh, and so all signs seem to point to the TPS. So in this episode, as we'll see, I do successfully replace the TPS. As far as I know, this is going to be on the internet, the only video of a throttle position sensor replacement on a BMW M20 engine. This is the 2.7 liter. It came in both a 2.5 and a 2.7 liter. Uh, the other straight six of the era was the 3.5 M30 uh, engine, which I did not have. Uh, so this, as far as I could tell, this is the only one that the TPS on the M20 is hard to get to. It's on the underside of the throttle. Uh, on the M30, it's real easy to get to. And all the write-ups I could find were on the M30. Uh, a couple forums just talking about it being a PETA. Um, forum folks will know what that is. So um, this is a peculiar operation. It is, uh, it, you know, so uh, anyway, so we got those two on the slate today. Again, uh, philosophically, I think this is an interesting place to start the show, too, because it reminds us that not every time when you successfully complete a job will you fix the car. Sometimes it takes multiple fixes. There's lots of different reasons. The thing that pushes me, that impels me on in those scenarios, uh, is just the reality that um, it's better to have replaced it than not. And sometimes you have situations where you'll have multiple parts in a system fail, um, sometimes it needed to be replaced, but it's, you know, not the only thing that needs to be replaced. And so sometimes, uh, operations take multiple stages as we have in both of these scenarios. So, uh, without further ado, enjoy. All right. Looking at our smog pump replacement on the 1989 Ford F-150, the tools you're going to need for this operation include a socket wrench set. Uh, this is to have U.S. standard sizes in it, so half inch, that sort of thing, seven eighths, and also a screwdriver set. Particularly, you're going to need some flat blade screwdrivers, but nothing out of the ordinary, nothing too strange. You will need with the socket wrench set a good long one. You you can't use like a little teeny uh, wrench because you're going to need to have some leverage to get the serpentine belt off, which is uh, potentially the the hardest part of the operation. For time, this is going to take a do it yourself for about one to two hours. In a proper shop setting, this could be done in as little as half an hour, but working out of your house, you should plan at least an hour, if not two hours, for the total operation. And the difficulty is not too difficult. There's nothing weird or strange. Again, the most problematic part is just getting the serpentine belt. Not necessarily off, that's a, that's a pretty easy operation if you have enough arm strength to wrench it over, but getting it back on, really it's helpful to have a second pair of hands. Also remember the smog pump itself is very heavy. You're going to be working under it and pulling it out as well as when you're replacing it. So, you know, don't don't let it just be sitting in there and come down and conk you in the head. It could really do some damage. This operation is easier on a lift, but uh, can be done uh, without the use of a lift or even jacking and the truck is disabled. So keep that in mind. So we have the there it is the second auxiliary pulley right here just underneath the alternator which is attached here to the uh, tensioner and the issue is that the smog pump is a secondary air pump basically pulling air through the engine system and if it's not turning properly then it can suck power and really drain an engine and cause you to get really terrible mileage. Uh, basically the idea is that if it's losing power, especially when you're at idle, you only have a few horsepower when your engine is sitting down on idle. And if this is sucking, let's just say five horsepower, if you're only getting say 20, 25 horsepower at idle, that's sucking about a quarter of your power. So it'll, blah, 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 blah. it'll seem like it's chugging and trying to push and it, it seems a little uneven. So uh, most likely we're dealing with that smog pump. When I bought this truck, the smog pump had been disabled. They had cut it off. That's an emissions issue and uh, just a general no-no. Uh, a lot of people just immediately say when you say you got a bad smog pump, oh, cut it off. Well, okay, but that's really not legal and not the best thing to do. Um, we've already replaced the EGR tube. That is the tube that goes and dumps out this extra air that it's pulling through into the exhaust system. And so the rest of the system has already been tuned up. Uh, the $7,000 mechanic replaced everything in the system but the smog pump. 
itself, even though they had it all disassembled and they could have very easily replaced it. Uh, they didn't, so that's going to be up to me now. The smog pump, you can see here I got a remanufactured Cardone smog pump. And, you know, leave it up to Ford for this sort of a thing. This, this year, this engine, so we're talking 1989 F-150, 5.8 liter, this vehicle could have one of three smog pumps. And so almost the same, but the configuration is slightly different on each of them. So I was able to figure out which one I needed because of the configuration differences. I got my uh, phone stuck down into the hole and um, the, so you got, this is the key piece, the configuration of the two tubes here. See that? The two tubes. This is the issue, right? Uh, so here we have, it's going to say, okay, at least 500 miles break-in period. Well, that would have been nice if this had a new one, but it doesn't. So I'm pretty sure that the squeaking is not uh, not right. It does need to be replaced. It's probably the reason why the former owner uh, took it off and disabled it. So we're going to have to, or it's not terribly hard to get to. It would be easier if we had a lift to get at it from underneath, but pretty straightforward. We're going to do the tensioner here. This is your tensioner pulley, right? So we're going to detension the serpentine belt right here. And after we do that, we're going to take this off, we're going to take the tensioner off, we're going to take the alternator off, and then get down to the smog pump, which is right beneath the alternator. Alright, so we're going to be starting here by removing our serpentine belt. Serpentine belt, you can always refer back if you're unsure later where everything goes. There's a nice little diagram. In the front here, the 5 liter and the 5.8 are the same design, just different displacement. And you can see there, you just put your wrench onto the idler pulley and relieve tension and pops off very quick and easy. A nice easy system here. So I'm just going to pull until I get enough so I can get upward. There we go. Alright, I'm not going to worry about the rest of it because we're only partially disabling here. So that's our first stage. And second stage Move the rest of our bolts here. I already loosened them up. Alright, so this is where we're at on the F-150 smog pump. We have the alternator disconnected. We have the serpentine belt pump. And currently, I'm working on removing the pulley from the old smog pump, which is going to have to come off in order to get the old smog pump off. And we're going to have to put the pulley onto the new smog pump. Alright, so we've successfully removed the pulley. Real easy to do. Just had three bolts on it. Needs a 10 millimeter wrench to get them off. Very easy. Now I noticed having pulled them off that presumably the $7,000 truck mechanic guy, uh, maybe even a former owner or somebody, got a bunch of gasket sealer onto this big blob of it. So uh, as part of my restoration, I'm going to machine this up real nice and make sure it's nice and good to go before I put it onto our new smog pump. Um, the bolts on this were not hard to remove because the smog pump has been recently removed. In hindsight, I would probably recommend at least breaking these bolts while you have the serpentine tension on it. Luckily, the smog pump, I do believe, is seized because I was able to pop it off uh, and break those bolts, no problem. Alright, so we are underneath now and looking at the smog pump we've already got the pulley off I'm gonna have to disconnect those two clamps right there which again the system has been recently redone everything except the pump itself come on guys all right so here is our removed smog pump the trick with the back bolt is it actually bolts on to see this piece right here and so I'm going to have to take this off and transfer it over to the new smog pump. But you see we have the same configuration, particularly of this valve right here. That's the important bit. 
everything looks like it should line up and we'll be putting a new one on all right so i've begun to machine the pulley here i've sprayed it with some wd-40 i'm using a dremel rotary tool here with a metallic brush head Just arresting all the rust little bits and flakes that we find there knocking off that uh, gasket sealer that the previous mechanic had uh, splashed on here. The problem with that is that these pulleys need to be about as close to perfectly round as you can get and to have a, a goop of, of the sealer, uh, gasket sealer on it will make it just slightly off balance which is not what you want. So I'm trying to get rid of all the deposits here, oil it real good, get all the, the crap out of the grooves here as well. These grooves are very important that they are nice and clean, that they have no rust on them, because if you get rust and build up in those grooves, then they can bite into and you know, you're creating friction. It'll destroy your serpentine belt. So going to machine this for a few minutes, get it nice and oiled, and then a nice thin layer not on the grooves, but on the body of the pulley, I'm going to put some uh, of the high temperature wheel bearing grease, which as you'll hear me talk about variously is great stuff and really good for rust prevention, um, particularly for stuff that's gonna be on the underside of the car, getting a lot of car grease. All right, so we've got the new smog pump installed. I had to hammer it pretty much every step of the way to get it to go back in there. It's a very tight fit, but we've got that back on, so I need to reattach. I've got all the lines attached to it, so we got to put the pulley back on it and make sure everything's good and snug, then put the alternator back on, then serpentine belt, and we are done. All right, so at this stage you can see we've got the smog pump back on, and it is spinning much more freely. I couldn't tighten the bolts down on the pulley hard enough. I had to, of course, leave the pulley off to get it back on there. And I've got them a little bit stronger than finger tight on now, but I, the pulley gave no resistance, which is good, because the old pulley uh, gave enough resistance I was able to get the pulley bolts off without it even being on the serpentine belt. So we've got our two there and there, plugs back into this. Everything is ready to go. All we have to do is uh, basically feed our serpentine belt back over all the lines. This, I highly recommend grabbing a second pair of hands simply because it's not a hard thing to do, but it can be a little bit tricky to get it all lined up. So again, you want to follow the uh, diagram right here. Let's see, we're going to start on our tensioner, go over the AC pulley there, down, around, do that S in the middle, come around to smog pump here, which is kind of come off there, and then up around the alt as I, so go ahead and grab that with your finger there, and as I detension it more, there we go. All right, make sure everybody is on track. Yeah, this guy here is a little bit off. Okay. It's tough to do by yourself. It is. It's definitely better to have an extra pair of hands. Not absolutely necessary, but very helpful. All right, uh, visual inspection looks good. Everybody's lined up. Let's crank her up and see what we got. For today's throttle position sensor replacement or TPS replacement on our 1988 BMW 528e, 
you will need a socket wrench set, this being in metric sizes. A uh, good rule on the Germans is that they tend to go 8, 10, 13, 17. Those tend to be your go-to sizes. You're also going to need, included in that, a set of extensions. It's a little bit tight to get into and around the throttle to unbuckle it from the uh, from the intake system, so make sure you have some extensions, particularly some joints, to give you some rotation there. Also some screwdrivers for unbuckling the intake boot. This is a pretty easy job. I would put it at about a 4 out of 10. Uh, the online forums call it a PETA. That's primarily just in response to it being much harder to do on the M20 than on the M30 engine. The M30 engine, it sits right up on top. Very easy. It's like a five-minute issue. So in comparison, yes, this is a lot more difficult. Still not that hard. Just take your time, be patient, and work through it. Also, some recommendations while you're in there. Clean all the intake pieces. Check your boots. Everything that's rubber, check it for rot. Uh, oil it and grease it if it's still in good shape. Otherwise, replace it. Also make sure that you don't lose the electrical connector retainer clips. These are the little metal clips that clip to the outside electrical housing and keeps them snug. This is absolutely essential for all these connectors, but particularly for the TPS, which you can't physically get to without removing the throttle. And it sits right on top of the engine, so it has a tendency to shake loose. So make sure that you keep track of those. Also, this is a good opportunity to do a smoke test to see if you have uh, leaking injectors, as I found that I did, uh, or around the take uh, and also be careful not to break off rusty bolts so make sure you use some penetrating oil and really take your time don't over torque you do not want to have to drill these out all right so we are looking at a 1988 BMW E28 chassis this is the 528e with the 2.7 liter straight six as you can see I have already disassembled the throttle here which is held on by these four bolts and I have taken off the throttle position sensor which is going to go right there and so we are going to pop a new one in and get it situated. The old screws were rather stripped so I'm going to see if I can't find something a little bit better to hold it in and go from there. Alright, so this is our new sensor that we are going to be putting in here. We've got a OEM Bosch, very important for sensors and the like, the OEM on German cars. And so this just situates on the bottom here of the throttle body. different screws in this time. These are a little bit coarser. And this is not the easiest thing to get to. So we want to make sure that we put on we can get it off pretty easy. Okay. So because of the peculiarity Unfortunately, the M20, the, uh, the 2.7 liter straight six, is a bit harder to get to. The M30, the larger uh, straight six from that era, is a lot easier to get to. Uh, so we've got our extender. We use that 10 millimeter on all four of those. And you got to get all your fittings back on. Um, like this one right here is a little sneaky and likes to hide back there, but we'll get him 
this boot is cracked and leathered. I'm going to replace it. It's, of course, really easy to get off. You just have, you know, these two connectors here that you have to loosen. Real easy to pop off. All pretty straightforward stuff. This is an old vehicle, so pretty straightforward design on most of the aspects. in there you can see the original pretty dirty and weather not terribly bad but you have to ask how old this thing is because it is actually BMW so who knows how long it's been since that's been changed personally I'm a big fan of AN air filters so maybe if we get this YouTube show launched they might be one of my sponsors I am a big fan. I put them in all my vehicles. And they are more expensive, but they give you lifelong filter. You just have to oil it. Uh, when you would otherwise replace a normal filter, you oil and clean out these. Okay. So we've got our air box here. Now, these actually pop on with thumb tabs all the way around. And that's not too tough. But then you also have to get it lined up on the chassis here. You have these retaining screws. There's also a flange piece underneath, which you're supposed to let's get those out. On there, okay. So it kind of sits down onto that flange piece underneath these two screws here. These uh, nuts. That's where it tightens down. Once we get it all back in place, let's put the screws on and we should be good to go. Alright, so we have reassembled the throttle body. We've got all four of the screws back there. All of this I hadn't messed with, I just left that on top. Uh, this is the linkage. This is actually a manual drive in terms of when you pull the press the accelerator it pulls on this physically. Uh, we got all of our hoses, we got our side hoses on all of the connectors connected and the air box has been secured and tabbed. It's got the new filter in it. I noticed that this looks like it's missing a piece. It should have a breather that connects to the front. Uh, I'll have to look that one up online. But uh, hopefully, we should be good to go. We will see if that uh, fixes our idle issue. Alright, so the moment of truth. Battery hooked up there. And we have... Oh! Still trying to track the rough idle situation in the 528E. I am using a little black and mild cigar and blowing some smoke. Into the intake, can you see? Ba -ba. It's coming up around the fuel injector. in a forum online that the fuel injectors might just need to have their O-rings so they probably need to be cleaned and resealed because it is definitely blowing smoke and it should not do that so that's going to be our next stage we're also going to fix we're still planning on that I've already got this on order to 
six, the J boot, there the intake boot, which of course is just shot. You can see it's totally wore out, but that's at least a good step in the right direction. I think we might have our answer figured out here. Well, today may not have been a great success, to put it lightly. The truck is somehow worse than when I started. The smog pump situation does not seem to be a problem necessarily. Now it won't even start, so there's a few things that it could possibly be. We've got it hooked up charging here uh, to get the battery charged back up. Hopefully we can get it moved at least, since it's kind of stuck in the middle of everything. The BMW, we were able to get the hood supports, so ta -da! now it lifts very nicely. We were able to discern that there is definitely something coming from some air coming out of the injectors, which are down in there, so we're probably going to have to, I'm going to research this some more to be sure and make sure I get the right stuff, but probably going to have to take this intake off, which will give me a good opportunity to get it all cleaned. This is going to be quite an operation, but we should be able to get it fixed. Just a little setback, but I'm also going to watch the drainage situation. Supposedly the uh, car has a battery drain. I uh, was a bit surprised at that because when you put the uh, the head on it, there's there's very little spark, almost nothing. You can't even hardly tell that it turns anything on. And usually, if you're having uh, you know enough drain to kill a battery, usually it'll spark because it's going to be running a lot of uh, power out of it uh, just when it's off. Keys off. We don't have that, so we're going to have to see about that. Um, but you know, at least it's this one's still turning on, so I was able to move it back a little bit. Um, got our next project lined up for us, so we will see about that. And in the meantime, we're trying to get the truck moved, since it's just kind of stuck in the middle of everything at the moment. For our first car profile, we're going to be looking at the 1993 Mercedes-Benz 400 SEL. This is a fantastic car that we really came into a great deal on. We got it for 2500 bucks from a private seller. It is a V140 chassis. These were made from 91 to 93, although the same actual chassis continued in production until 98 under Phase 2. It was rebranded from 400 SEL to S400, and they started putting the letters in front of the numbers. You'll notice that in these German markings, the numbers there are for the engine, so 400 is that it's a 4 liter, or was a 4 liter that they bored out to 4.2 liter, and then SEL refers to the uh, the size of the vehicle. So you have the E-Class, then the SE is the larger, and then the SEL is the extended wheelbase. So this is actually a V140, although if you ever are searching for parts, you should search for W140. That covers the wider range of uh, the series. You can see the rundown of its uh, power, performance, and so forth. This is the 4.2 liter M119 engine. It gets 275 horsepower and just about 300 pounds of torque. Uh, it is a very flat acceleration curve, very indicative of Mercedes. Um, while these are only rated for about 16 miles per gallon, we have gotten consistently around 20 um, around town, around here in a rural area, and better on the highway. Uh, it is a massive vehicle, very, very big, and weighs almost 5,000 pounds with passengers, uh, with, uh, you know, driver and everything, easily over 5,000 pounds. Uh, for its day and age, you know, it's not the fastest car, but it is still very, it'll get up and go, it'll surprise you, uh, and it was noted, the line was noted for its, you know, supposed over-engineering, that it's got all sorts of gadgets and everything, but I am amazed that all these years later, uh, and all these miles later, it is still actually working, everything like the air conditioning, the memory settings, it's an incredible car, and we're going to walk you through it. For our first car profile, we are going to look at this 1993 Mercedes-Benz 400 SEL. This is the 4.2 liter V8 with the SEL body. That is the E-Class within the extended, which is the SE. 
and then this has the limousine back seat, the extended body for the L. So this was a flagship top of the line Mercedes-Benz for its day. Uh, it is amazing for 1993 how many things this has that have now become industry standards. Now this particular one has been retrofitted with a uh, an engine start-stop button in lieu of the original key and we will go ahead and start it up here. It's a very strong running uh, car. The engine's in great shape. Been doing various things to it. Oil change and tune up with some new spark plugs and so forth. Just going through cleaning it. New air filter, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, this is, again, remember that this is a 1993. It has three zones of control, including automatic temperature systems. Uh, amazingly, the air conditioning still works in this 25-year-old car, and this works very, very well. Uh, this controls the back seat, which also includes these two, and that's just either heat or cool. And then you have your two driver and passenger side. Um, a number of interesting features here. For example, the this car is fitted with three position memory positions which includes the seat position the steering wheel position both side view mirror positions and has a motor controlled rear view mirror so when I sit down in it and I press my number all of that is configured so I can sit down and everything is exactly as I want it again amazing technology for 1993 uh, the design here was actually designed in the late 80s so again these are things that have since become, uh, you know, not uh, standards as in all cars have them, but luxury standards. This even includes memory settings for the second seat, and this car currently has 172,000 miles on it. We bought it with 168, and it has run pretty well flawlessly. It does eat a little bit of oil. We have to uh, top off the oil. We just make it part of our gas up routine. Um, one of the things which we are planning to do in the near future is a uh, seal uh, on the, uh, the valves, the valve seals. I've got those already. I'm just waiting to do that job. Valve seals and we're going to replace the valve uh, cover gaskets while we're in there as well. Um, this is a reasonably powerful car, particularly for the day, quite powerful. 275 horsepower, around 300 pounds of torque. Uh, since I bought it, a few of the things, uh, one of the very first things I did, this was broken. The parking release there was broken, and just the handle part, and so you had to use a vice grip to grab the, the broken part back there to pull it out, which was rather obnoxious. Uh, so I replaced that. Uh, which was actually not terribly hard, just to, you know, if you have to replace it, you go down through the the vent here, you go down from up top. This is actually ridiculously difficult to get off the underside here, but you can get your arm through there uh, in order to take off the, there's a uh, wire in there that runs down into the parking brake system. And, um, okay, so we are going to pop the hood here. I can show you the rest of the car. One thing that Mercedes, you'll find, they love to do this, where they will hide compartments everywhere. All four of the doors have that. Uh, you also have this compartment here, which uh, hides this stuff in there. You've got the glove compartment over there, and uh, of course the compartment here. Now there's no cup holders in here, which is kind of obnoxious. Um, oh, where did that go? Yeah, you have this compartment here as well. This car actually came with its own stripper picture, <laughs> signed to someone named Mickey in 1996 uh, from a Ms. Ashley Lauren. We just kept that because we thought that was funny. You can see this has also been updated where they put a DVD player in there, which is great because we can hook our iPod and phones and stuff. Again, the uh, push button is aftermarket. We had the problem with the push button that one point I got in and I pushed it and it just went boop. 
into in there and so we we actually my uncle al and i worked a uh, uh very peculiar retainer clip out of a piece of coat hanger and uh, got that so when you pop it you know here's your hood bit right here so uh, here's our engine I was just uh, cleaning it up so it's a little damp from a uh, quick detailing job uh, beautiful engine compartment I one of the things I've fallen in love with Mercedes is the, uh, the the design of the engine bay and how everything is so well laid out uh, I'm, I'm amazed by all the ways in which they cover and protect things. So this front part, you can just pop off. Uh, you can see the engine under there. Now this is a very typical design. In the uh, They went from the big round air filter on top in the 90s, in the late 80s, and into the 90s. They went to what is still standard, the, the dual nose intake. See there going in. And so this is actually your air box and it sits on top of the engine again the air comes in both ways you have an air filter there and an air filter there in order to actually get all this apart you have to pop the whole thing off it's not as hard as it seems you just physically pop it off and it's pretty easy to uh, get back together and so forth and again one of the things that i just love about mercedes is how well everything is laid out it's all very well organized all of the electronics tend to be very well protected um, this is again a 4.2 liter V8. Uh, it's a very nice, you know, it's very typical of Mercedes that the power is very even and consistent. You don't have a surge. Like for example, the BMWs tend to feel a lot more muscly because they have a uh, very early power band, very twerky on the front end. So it makes it surge. Uh, Mercedes, you don't really feel like you're accelerating. It's just all of a sudden you're going fast. Uh, this is in very good condition. Uh, there's a few things that I've got to do to it. Uh, you can see somebody clipped there and um, put a little crack in the uh, the rear tail light there. Um, the SEL again has the extended back seat, which is one of the things I love about it. Kids have lots of room back here. It is only a four seater, so it does not have. A seat in the center um, but the kids love it back here lots of room very plush uh, interior very comfortable and uh, we just absolutely love this car really great car and very very comfortable to drive in uh, you really feel like you're in a tank supposedly the windows are bulletproof the the guy I bought it from said they were we had to replace the windshield because it had a big crack in it it is dual ply so it is shatter resistant but the person that put in the windshield uh, made me question whether it was actually bulletproof or not but that is the uh, hearsay but it definitely feels armored uh, we just put on some new wheels some new or, uh, new tires some new Cooper CS5 tires and uh, really good to go For our first viewer question, I was asked, what is the difference between AWD, all-wheel drive, and 4WD, four-wheel drive? And in particular, which is safer for mountain driving? This comes from Lauren S. in Texas. So while there is some overlap between the nomenclature, typically AWD means all-wheel drive. This means all-time real all-wheel drive. That is that all four wheels are always being given power from the engine. So you have here in this graphic that I made, very simple just to uh, show the parts of the system of the drivetrain. You have the engine, which then turns the transmission. That's where you choose your gear. And then that goes to either the front axles. These are the CV axles turning the front wheels or via drive shaft to a rear differential, which turns the rear wheels. And so all wheel drive systems uh, are very typical in Subarus, Audis as well have them. Um, it's more and more becoming uh, becoming regular. Uh, in our own uh, uh, parking lot, we have the E500, which is 4MATIC. That is the all-wheel drive system for Mercedes. Now, four-wheel drive, which is most typically found in trucks and Jeeps and off-roading vehicles and that sort of thing, you have the engine which feeds the trans, and then the trans is sent through what is called a transfer case. This is why in four-wheel drive vehicles, you have the option typically of two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive high or four-wheel drive low. Um, you also have some overlap 
for example, Sean, my good friend Sean, his Jeep is actually all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive high or four-wheel drive low, so you don't have a two-wheel drive option. You can either have the all-wheel drive system or the transfer case will lock in four-wheel drive. And that's typically what four-wheel drive indicates is that it is locked, so you're getting the same amount of power to all four wheels. And also, typically, four-wheel drive has that low setting, which, again, the transfer case is itself a kind of transmission in a sense it's just choosing how to to send the power uh, where to send it and so forth so all-wheel drive systems uh, often are adaptive where they can change the ratio in which it's giving power to the various wheels to maximize uh, performance four-wheel drive systems are typically locked in so to answer the question of which is actually safer, generally speaking, I would say all-wheel drive for you know families and that sort of thing. All-wheel drive is what you want. This is because if you're going, if, if one wheel or one axle is slipping, the computer will recognize that and will apply power so that you ha don't have a loss of friction. Four-wheel drive, it's just locking. Typically speaking, it's locking the differentials so that they're giving the same consistent power to all four wheels and this is typically used for uh, trailer hauling and for off-roading uh, not so much for family so if you're looking for a family vehicle I would say all-wheel drive is what you want if you're looking for that off-roading or truck four-wheel drive to end our first episode I want to end uh, each of these episodes with a prayer Thank you, God, for this opportunity of coming together, of sharing in this information, of the love of cars, of all the beautiful, wonderful things that you give us in this creation. I ask that you guide myself, my family, and my viewers in their lives so that no matter what wilderness they find themselves in, that they can find comfort and solace and peace in your word, in your deed, in your presence, in your love. I ask that you bring light to dim eyes, that you open up hearts, that you renew broken relationships, and that you guide us forward ever in your good gospel. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.